was staying with the NNPC. Now let's go to our first discuss for the day. The Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation is responsible for her nursing uh, Nigeria's oil and gas reserves for sustainable uh, national development. And it explores, produce, uh, refines oil and retails petroleum products. On the heels of the devastating impact of COVID-19 pandemic uh, on the global crude oil production uh, at the moment, the NNPC made the country proud last week uh, when it released its 2020 audited report. According to, 200, according to a 287 billion naira profit after tax in the 2020 financial year, making the achievement the first of its kind since its 44 years existence. With a turnaround loss of 803 billion naira in 2018 to profit of 287 billion in 2020, the corporation attributes the successful fit to aggressive implementation of cost-cutting measures, improved efficiency through business automation, emphasis on commercially focused investments, and non-interference in the management of the corporation from any quarters. Well, to discuss this and give more insight into this significant achievement, I have joining us live from our Abuja studios. And today is a special one. It's my birthday. Uh, the Group Managing Director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, Mr. Mele Kiari, joins us to discuss this. Thank you very much, Mr. Kiari. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Tola. Tola. Do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes, first of all, uh, happy birthday, and I wish you very prosperous and beneficial long life, just as I wish the same thing to the corporation. Yesterday is not NMPC's birthday, but I know for sure that NMPC will be there for long, and I would like you to also live long enough to see what great company this will be. Indeed. Thank you so much. I feel so honored. Now, the NNPC posted a profit after tax of 287 billion naira last year after a successful completion of the statutory annual audit exercise. Now, the sentiments ruling minds now is, this is, this beats imagination. Now, how, how does this come to you? Explain to us how this happened. How can we maintain this positive trajectory? Yes, thank you very much. I a bit of clarity in hearing you. I have some difficulty, but I can, I can understand where you're coming from. Uh, first of all, uh, it's really shocking for many onlookers to see a company jump from losses of $803 billion to profitability. This is very, very practical. And uh, when we announced that uh, we met losses of $803 billion Naira in our 2018 accounts, you know, we had no misgivings that uh, this surely was a very huge loss. And we knew, of course, that uh, shareholders, uh, at any, by any consideration, would be concerned that a company would lose such amount of money. But we also knew that that's a very huge challenge for us as a company. Uh, we can't continue to make losses. Uh, this is a trillion dollar uh, profit-making company. No doubt about it. And I'm sure many of us are aware that uh, small factories, uh, banks, uh, very uh, small-scale banks are declaring profit up stacks of more than 200 billion dollars. So it's really nothing big and no big deal for NMPC to come out and say that we made a profit of 287 billion naira in, in a fiscal year. Uh, for us, uh, this is very low, uh, it's a very small number. Uh, this is a potentially a, a trillion naira company. And of course, with all expectations, with all the resources available to us, we should not be declaring losses at any time. And therefore, we we are happy as, as company today that uh, we have come out of that hole, uh, that hole of 803 in, in 2018 coming out to, to a positive number in 20, 2020 is uh, it's a big progress. But that's also not magic. Uh, when you have a company of this size and of these potentials with all the resources available to it, you know, clearly there are things you can do different. First of all, you need to become much more efficient by automating your system and processes. You become more accountable and more transparent. You cut down your costs, you become more, more efficient in your operations, you select your portfolios rightly so that you don't put your money in the things that will clearly bring losses to you. And of course, uh, most importantly, you know, when you are procuring uh, services and equipment, you know, you make sure that you get them at the best of the price that is possible. And one thing we did, you know, in fiscal 2020, which probably informed this situation, is that uh, we asked all our contractors uh, bearing the COVID-19 situation, we said, look, we can't pay for this. Uh, can you give us a discount? 
and we, we demanded for 30 percent discount in all our procurement and and of course the the circumstances allowed for that and obviously our contractors were able to agree to cut down our cost by up to 30 percent in very many of our assets so the combined effects of uh, maximum efficiency more accountable more automation selecting the right portfolio and also investing in the right kind of business made us to come to a point where it, we, we got to where we are. And when you look at it on a relative basis, you know, when you move from $803 billion naira losses in, in 2018 to a positive number of 287, what you are actually looking at is a trillion, trillion, uh, one trillion naira gain. And this, of course, uh, I can say it uh, very clearly that uh, this is not too much. Uh, this company can actually make trillion naira uh, profit after tax. Uh, do you hear me well, Tolu? Yes, very well. Clearly, uh, I can see. Now, the cost-cutting measures are really commendable. So, are you saying that accountability and transparency are not the watchword at the NNPC? Absolutely, because uh, we know for sure that uh, historically, you know, very many people have doubts about what NNPC does. Our shareholders think that we're an opaque company, that we're not representing them well, and that they don't know what we're doing. And I'm sure many times you see us in the media, uh, also even in the public space, in, in very many fora, you know, everybody thinks that uh, and nobody knows what NNPC is doing. That we knew that that trust is very essential for our business. We also know that uh, even our partners, you know, financing institutions, you know, even commercial partners, you know, would like to see and know what you're doing so that they can invest in you and in their relationships. So we knew that making transparency accountability a primary focus of our activities will serve the best interests and, and that also enable our partners to see what we are doing. Borrowing became easier for us and also our partners, both internal and external partners, become conscious of what they are doing because they, they know that there's a radar on what we are doing. They know that we are going to disclose everything we are doing, no matter what it is, and that enables a number of... Uh, opportunities uh, which has seen us where we are so let's say that this will be a continuous process i mean the audit it should be a regular thing yearly thing is that what we should expect gmd not just audit uh, we're doing something different you know we're the only company that publishes its financial and operational performance every month anywhere in the world no national oil company does this and the meaning of this is that we are making the scrutiny of our operations and our finances open to all our shareholders, particularly Nigerians and our partners. And secondly, audit, publishing audited financial statement is actually a requirement of the law. Uh, we should have been doing it all this while. We didn't do it. But now that uh, we're also tra transmitting into a karma company, as you are aware, the company that's going to be bound by the company that allied matters as you know, it's a matter of duty and a matter of uh, responsibility for every company to publish its audited financial scheme. First, we are very happy doing it. It's good for our company. It has endless opportunities in financing. It has also given us a, a privilege to, to share what we are doing with our shareholders. So, obviously, we're not going to stop it, you know, first by the requirement of the law and secondly because uh, this is the right thing to do. Like you used to say, NNPC will be accountable for the more than 200 million Nigerians uh, because we own that company. A a away from this, let's discuss reactions that have trailed the Petroleum Industry Act. Of course, a lot of issues from the host communities and uh, they disagree with some of your claims. How do you react to this? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Tolo. You see, uh, the Petroleum Industry Act is uh, history made because as you may be aware, uh, it's been ongoing for over 20 years, uh, trying to fix the oil and gas uh, fiscal framework and the regulatory framework. It hasn't worked really. And of course, uh, as, a, as a bill in the National Assembly, it was there since 2008, and we're not able to cross that. But more importantly, as uh, many, many are aware, the Petroleum Act that we're operating today is essentially Petroleum Act 1967. There hasn't been significant changes to the provisions of the Petroleum Act since 1969. The, the net effect is that we are running a very archaic uh, petroleum system and petroleum uh, legislation, legislative framework. And that made things worse for us because, you know, investors are looking forward to a very modern industry where you have a robust and competitive fiscal framework. Countries have moved forward. Oil is found in very many new locations and destinations that we never thought it will, it will happen. And ultimately, the end result is that uh, investors are not seeing our country as an attractive location because our regulations are weak, and also our fiscal framework is uh, not competitive. And ultimately, uh, what did we suffer? In the last five years, there are over $50 billion 
dollars of direct investment into the petroleum sector in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Out of that, barely $3 billion dollars came into Nigeria. This is a reflection of what the world thinks about what we are doing here. And we know that by the passage, by the accent of the petroleum industry, Gardner, there is a very, very new fiscal framework. There is a new regulatory framework which has become very competitive, modern, and, uh, and of course with key highlights. Uh, essentially focusing on gas development so that the you know, gas can come into our country, we can create new prosperity in our country. We can also move focus from oil into gas as a transition fuel and ultimately create oil and the prosperity that this country can easily have from the petroleum in industry. For us, uh, this is history made. It wouldn't have been possible and we would like to thank particularly Mr. President for his uh, supporting us and giving the step to bring us to this uh, situation. But having said that, you know, uh, were there specific things that could have been done differently in the bill? Absolutely, yes. Of course, uh, uh, no law is perfect. Uh, we know that there's a process in the National Assembly for uh, making amendments, uh, whatever that uh, occurs. But what is most significant in the bill is the provision for the host communities. And I'm sure that you had a lot of talks around it in the, in the social media and also in the, in, the, in the print media and also in the public space around inadequacy of search for and, uh, and all, all the debates around it. What I can say is that uh, first of all, the host community provision in the bill is, self, is the creation of Mr. President. He asked that this should be done. And the reasons are very simple. Uh, first of all, uh, we did the license to operate in our host communities. And over the years, there are a number of interventions uh, that are too many to mention, but typically uh, you are aware of the 13% derivation, the NDDs, and so on and so forth. All those interventions haven't really delivered the value that is expected the community because the communities are really not in charge of what they are what we're trying to do for them very often i'm sure you must have seen this uh, in very many space that uh, companies will come and build a town hall for the community that's not what they want in many communities today you will see a flow station uh, that is 200 kilometers away from from a community and that community will not even have drinking water yet you know uh, maybe a kilometer away a town hall is built for this community so that's not what they want and obviously, uh, that's not the right way to do this. So we uh, this government decided that we must intervene directly. And of course, there's this talk around percentages. You know, I know this is a very uh, topical issue, but you know, when people talk about percentages, they don't know percentage of what. For instance, when you say 3% of uh, your annual spend on operating expense, what you are really dealing with is 3% of $16 billion, which we did in fiscal 2020. And 3% of... Uh, $16 billion is a lot of money. It's over $500 million. It's bigger than the budget of NDDC. And when it is properly managed and applied, you know, of course, it's going to see the transformation that we haven't seen before. And this is sometimes connected in the political space around, oh, you're doing uh, frontier exploration, 30% of NMPC's profit oil. And I think this is a number of misunderstandings around this. 30% uh, of what? I think that's the fact that people don't understand. First of all, when you say profit oil for production sharing company, it's a very small number. At the very best, you probably make $400 million out of that transaction. But by the way, uh, the other concern is whether or not uh, this sense that it is probably for exploration in a certain part of the country. It is not correct. When you say frontier, you actually mean where oil could potentially be found, but where you don't have commercial oil today. And frontier means that everywhere that you can think of, for instance, the Ultra Deep Water Niger Delta itself is frontier basin. The Anambra platform is frontier. The Calabar embankment is uh, frontier. And also the middle and the over Benue and many other locations, the Dahomey, around Epe, and so on. We are working everywhere. Uh, it has nothing to do with geography. When you say frontier, it's actually a technical word that we are, we are utilizing. And, and I, can, I can say with all certainty that. Uh, uh, oil is there in very many places. We have found commercial oil in the places that people don't expect that we will find. We are working on it to make sure that that is all further matured into development. And, and I'm sure Nigerians will understand that uh, maybe our communication was a bit weak to look. Probably that's correct. But the, the key issue is that it was nothing to do with politics. Uh, uh, these are technical situations. Let's not look at our oil production volumes, that means OPEC policies versus the state of our four major refineries and the subsidy regime, which has seen us expend more than 500 billion in the first half of the year in the scope of the Petroleum Industry Act. To what extent do you see a turnaround from what we've been doing before and prospects for greater resource optimization in the nearest future? I think it's not about spending. The, the figures you have got it probably relates to the value of the EPC contract that we have awarded for, for the rehabilitation of Potaco Refinery right. and also of Kaduna and, and Wari refin Refineries. Yeah. Uh, no doubt, uh, uh, this is a monumental step that the corporation took. Uh, we agreed that you know, we haven't done very well you know, managing the refineries in the last 20, 20 years of plus. 
And uh, this is as a result of many things. We don't want to lament. Yes, uh, something has happened. It has happened. But you know what? The end result is that the family is in such a state that you're no longer doing a typical turnaround maintenance. What you are doing is from complete replacement of some parts and also making it work so that it can come back to its uh, uh, capacity of about 90% of its installed capacity. This is very typical. And we can abandon it. For instance, the options, there are many options that people have suggested, but that which we know, one of them is that, why don't you just dispose this and then build a new refinery? I can tell you that when you want to build a refinery, capacity of the four of them that we have today, at four, feet, four, four, five uh, barrels per day, you know, you will spend nothing less than 12 to 13 billion dollars to do it. It's not possible to do it below that. Even that is just for the within the uh, boundary limits of the refinery. It just means the refinery and the process plant, you know. When refinery estimates are made, they are usually excludes tank farms, uh, uh, dis uh, dis discharge lines, SBMs, where you take out the products and all this. They are not part of the cost. So when you add this up, you know, you will see that you are really dealing with uh, something much bigger than you can afford today. So, but what's wrong in making sure that if you can bring it back to uh, service in, with, at 90 percent of its installed capacity at a cost that is probably around $3 billion? For, for four refineries that will produce over 80 million liters of gasoline. I think it's a very good thing that we have to do. Uh, we can afford to ab abandon it. Of course, you know, even when you want to make a re new refinery, it's very different from uh, fixing one. For instance, uh, the plan that we have is to start production from these refineries quicker than the end result of it, uh, end time of it. And, and that means that the federal products will be available in our country much earlier than the total completion of this process. But when you want to build a new refinery, it's nowhere near uh, one to two years, you can't do uh, 450,000 barrels per day refinery in two years. It's not possible, it's not practical. But you can fix this in two years. And of course, it does also take out the possibility that you can do many things uh, in, in the country. There are several licenses granted for refinery. We also on our own are working on several initiatives to make sure that we have some condensed refineries of small scale, 50,000 barrels per day or less. And the end result is that we should be able to process most of the crude oil that we produce in this country. By doing this, you are adding value, you are creating opportunities, you are creating wealth. And also combating this country a net export of petroleum product and that's what we should be we haven't done that and therefore when you hear about cost you know is the ultimate value is the is the real thing did we do the right thing by making sure that we are what this going absolutely yes i completely agree that uh, this is the right step to take uh, is that the best price that you can get absolutely yes because we were to play this took place through under one of the most open and transparent tender process that we can ever have and of course, uh, this can be tested. We are open. We can publish the processes if that's necessary. But otherwise, I can tell you that you, know, you couldn't have done better than this, Tolu. All right. Now, GMD, the NNPC's oversight function is also critical to the overall performance of refineries in the country. Let me ask you, with the agenda of equities participation sought in the likes of Dangote Refinery and others, what does this portend? Yes, uh, it does many things. First of all, no country, no resource-defending country, will see a refinery of this capacity, 650,000 barrels per day, and not take interest in it. Interest in two ways. It can either be a participating partner or have an absolute interest in making sure that this works. So it is in the best interest of any country to make sure that when you have a refinery of such capacity, you make sure that it happens, it works, as well as also it delivers value into your country. And of course, uh, there's this misconception that we're probably trying to help all Mr. Dangote, and absolutely not. We, we actually demanded for this as a matter of policy, that we know that there's opportunity in this. We know that this refinery will do well. We also know that even if you're as an investor, when you put your money in this refinery, within three to five years, you recover your full cost. And not only that, uh, we know for sure that as we would start to start a refinery of our own today of 650, uh, it's going to take us another five years to get it done. And secondly, even if you want to build a refinery, you know, talk around uh, cost of uh, the acquisition of 20% equity of $2.7 billion. It's nothing when you look at the value that is on the table. Because if you take 20% of 650,000 barrels per day, you are looking at 130,000 barrels per day capacity. That's what you are buying. If you want to build a refinery of that capacity, there is no way $2.7 billion is going to build for you, even an ordinary process refinery. But what we are buying is a refinery plus a petrochemical plant. And therefore, you know, for us, it's a good deal. Uh, first of all, the numbers have shown that we can actually get back our money between three and five years. We are not taking any government money to buy this equity from this. It's also going to create a market for our crude oil sell because uh, we did something that is useful for this country. First of all, this refinery, as you may be aware, is in the export-free zone. 
uh, the meaning of this is that you can, they can acquire their feedstock from anywhere. So part of the requirement of this, uh, our entry is that this refinery must buy at least 300,000 barrels of crude oil from us. And from it, we make part of part payment for the, uh, for the equity that we're acquiring. And of course, the other part of it is that we're borrowing from Afrexim and a consortium of banks, including Afrexim, to buy from it. So it's not burden to the state, it's not burden to this country. What we're doing is an opportunity that we saw, uh, which will essentially mean that you know, we're going to cream up from the value of this huge refinery. More importantly, uh, it's going to ensure uh, energy security for our country. First, uh, by right now, by taking 20% equity in it, it means that NMPs can practically have rights to the disposal of 20% of the production from this plan. Uh, this means that uh, it can be the basis for having a strategic national reserve that we can always keep, and also to see us in the line of business that others are doing. Typically, our partners are a peer group all over the world, Aramco and Co. Everybody is expanding his portfolio. Nobody wants to put his money in one location, and therefore putting our money in this portfolio is the right thing to do. Hmm. Now, the future of crude is growing dim, uh, GMD. You must yes. agree with me. In the next decade or two, we cannot see the same usefulness as it used to be. Deepening natural gas utilization under the National Gas Expansion Plan to earn more carbon credits and create a net zero carbon environment, no doubt, is most strategic. How do we begin to develop and leverage on this? I, I didn't hear you well. Uh, can you repeat that? Please? Yes. All right. I'm talking about the future of crude going dim how are we preparing to take advantage even of gas uh you know in the next decade of or, or two looking at our gas expansion program yes uh, Tolu, uh as i mentioned earlier uh this is a gas country mm. you know we have 203 trillion scope of proven gas potentially over 600 trillion scope of gas and and we haven't done enough uh, uh, investing in it and producing the gas. And the end result is that you know, we are seen as an oil country, but we're actually not an oil country. And as the energy transition conversation is going on globally, you know, gas is a, a transition fuel in very many jurisdictions. And indeed, uh, uh, the COVID-19 situation has actually proven to us that it's much more resilient than the oil itself. And because uh, most of the losses that we, the industry saw came actually from the production of the liquids. So having said this, you know, and then with the uh, accent of the petroleum industry, at which is essentially focused on making sure that we deepen gas uh, uh, monetization, both domestically and for export, and also declaring uh, 2020 going, 21 going forward as the decade of gas, which means that we'll invest more money in it, we'll put up more st infrastructure, and then we'll, of course, uh, commercialize the gas as much as is possible, and, and ultimately, you know, drive value from it. You know, what gas will do for this country is enormous. It will create prosperity. It will create jobs for all, and even for the subnational uh, institution and, and levels of government. And you will see that once you create more jobs and more opportunities, there will be more taxation that, we ca that will come up here as its own taxation that will come on the table. And of course, you know, ultimately improve our general infrastructure situation in, in, the, in the country. So for us, uh, gas is the future. Gas is, uh, of course, uh, uh, we haven't done enough in the past, but I know that what, what we have seen today, a number of infrastructure works that are going on, bringing the AKK on the line, the OB3 line, expanding the Lagos, Esclavos Lagos pipeline network, and ultimately creating the what we call the white structure for gas delivery into our country, uh, which, en en which ensures that you have gas all parts of the country within 200, 300 kilometers max of the major trunk line, and ultimately... Uh, this country will be gasified in a, in a let me put if that's the right word to use and then uh, what it will do is what it has done that we have seen today for instance when you go to certain areas of uh, parts of this country where we're able to deliver gas you will see that industries are springing up they are becoming much more profitable and and also because the power is everything and we also know that in very many locations uh, industries have come down because of uh, adequacy of power close to them I am aware of all of a number of interventions that are going on to, to the bottleneck our transmission system, but what works everywhere in the world is to have captive power plants very near to its end users so that you know losses are minimized, you know, companies become much more stable in, in terms of their getting access to energy. So gas is the future, it will pro provide power into our country, into captive industries. It will also provide the opportunity for creating gas based industry. They are already springing up, a number of fertilizer projects are, are coming up. A number of methanol projects are coming up, and uh, we know that ultimately uh, we'll take full value up from the gas. And as you are aware, energy itself is going on its trend seven. The, uh, there's no limit to this. 
uh, because the expansion is uh, is a continuous thing, and because we are not short of resources, I know for sure that you know more and more of such opportunities will will come up. All right, before I let you go, uh, GMD, uh, uh, back to PIA. Uh, steering committee has been set up. We have 12 months to uh, get to work and f get everything uh, activated. What are your expectations? And what more should we expect from the National Oil Company as we move on in the year? C can you take that again, Tolu? Okay. I said we have a steering committee for the PIA. What are your expectations from that committee? What should be done one after the other? Then... Uh, what are the what are our expectations from NNPC going forward? Did you get the GMD? Yeah, no, not clearly. Did you say uh, what do I? How do I see NNPC going forward as a yes, common company? Yes, yes, that, that is one question. Yes, what do you? What, how do yes. you see going forward? Yes. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, the PIA is very clear that within six months we must cooperate NNPC as a as a company that is bound under the rules of the Company and Allied Matters Act. The meaning of this is that you must be fully commercial, you must be profitable, you will have no access to any other resource other than from your own production and your own uh, productivity. So that means that uh, NMPC will be the different company that it has to be. Uh, yes, today we are on a good pedestal, we are on a profit le making level today, but it, as you are aware that uh, the resources that are available to us, the assets that are available to us means that this can actually potentially be a trillion naira company, multi-trillion naira company, not just one. And we have seen this happen all over the world uh, with, the, with the results that we have, with the assets that we have on ground today, that we know that this is going to be a very different company. Because uh, under the, when you become a limited liability company, you know, you become much more challenged. Uh, everything you are doing must be for purposes that is for profitability based or for commerciality. Uh, even while we render service to anyone, including the institutions of government, it will be at a fee, and the, the PI is very clear that uh, even when we render st service to the state, it will be at a, at a, at a fee. So uh, it's going to be a different game. Uh, I'm sure the, uh, you realize that what the work, has, the work that has been done so far, with all the commitments from the workforce that I can see today, which is uh, blossoming uh, much beyond what we can, we can think today, is that uh, we will do well as a karma company. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. I've been speaking to the Group Managing Director of the Nigerian National Petroleum Cooperation. I'm Mr. Mele Kiyari. Thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. really appreciate this. Thank you, Tore. Thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity.